Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me as always is a man that likes his Reuben sandwich just like Matthew McConaughey on Rye, on, on Rye, Rye, on Rye. Rye. Here is the captain. Thank you, thank you, thank you. It's good to be seen, and it's good to see you. Thanks for listening. Thanks for telling a friend. This evening, we are drinking Mo Guava by the fantastic people at Paradise Brewing Company in Clearwater, Florida. Garage grade four and a half bottle caps out of five. And how could it not get four and a half bottle caps? I love IPAs. I love guava. So a win-win. Mo Guava is an IPA perfect for summertime, brewed with mosaic hops. It's hoppy. It's tropical. It's sweet. You know what they say, Captain? Mo money, Mo Guava. <laughs> I don't think that's what they say. And Mo Guava is brought to us by Yvonne from Fort Atkinson, Wisconsin. That's Badger Country. Oh, and here's another Badger. We have Cynthia from Jansville, Wisconsin. Do you feel that, Captain? That's the Wisconsin love. Well, I guess they're Big Ten, so uh, go Big Ten and go Bucks. Next up, we have a shout-out from Mark in Aberdeen, UK. And a big shout-out from Lance from Texas. I wonder if that's Lance Harbor. The old Coyote football team. Next up, we have a note here that says, Keep up the drinking and storytelling from Heather in sunny California. And last but not least, we give a shout-out to Justin down in Marietta, Georgia. So thanks to everybody for buying us around for this week's show. And if you want to pitch in for next week's show, go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button. And everybody, please be patient. We're a little behind on the beer fun shout outs. But if you'd like to support the show, go to iTunes and rate us a five-star review. It really does help the show. All right, that's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer. Let's talk some true crime. In November of 2006, 19-year-old University of Missouri, Kansas City student Jesse Ross was participating in a university field trip. He, along with 13 other university students and a faculty sponsor, drove over 500 miles to Chicago, Illinois. This is for a model United Nations conference. This event drew over 1,000 college students from all over the country. Now, around 2.30 a.m., This would be early Tuesday morning on November 21st. This is about 12 hours after Jesse last called his mother. He got up from his chair. He was at this emergency meeting that they were doing for this UN conference. And he got up from his chair and he walked out of the meeting room for about a 30 minute break. The surveillance camera in the hotel lobby caught his image of of Jesse in the area of the exits of the building. And this was the last trace ever of 19-year-old Jesse Ross. In the last part, we talked about did he commit suicide or possibly did he try to walk away from his life and start a new life? Yeah, and we both agreed we didn't like either of these as being high probability uh, for what could have happened to Jesse. So continuing on the path here, let's get into what others have considered more likely scenarios. The first one we want to get into is the possibility that Jesse could have fallen into the river. Well, Mm -hmm. this would have been the Chicago River. um, And as the captain had said yesterday, the river empties into Lake Michigan. And this is this is late November. It's icy. It's cold. You know, the Mm -hmm. police say that this is what they find to be the most likely scenario. We have his parents saying, we disagree with that. We think he would have head head back to his own hotel, which would have actually taken him in the opposite direction of this river. Well, there's a scenic route behind the hotel where this UN conference was taking place. They're scheduled for this 30 minute break. He's seen heading towards the exits. What do you, what are your feelings here, captain regarding falling into the river? Well, I think we have to take a look at this surveillance footage and I can't find it online as, as, as far as that goes. I mean, I can, I have a picture and then we have the description. Now there's two description and, and I think this is coming from fine, uh, help find Jesse.com. Uh, do you know what that website is off the top of your head? Um, it's the one that parents, uh, is it, is it find find Jesse Ross. Ross. com. That's what it is. So what they claim is that the surveillance picked up the fact that he had a white t-shirt on, jeans, had a green warm-up jacket, uh, and he was walking towards the main door. 
the thing that I thought was interesting here was that he, they also claimed that he had a Gatorade bottle. Now, so Gatorade bottle, not so weird, mm-hmm. right? And you're going to a meeting. But this is also after we know that we have eyewitnesses that saw him drinking. Mm-hmm. So my question would be, what, what is in that Gatorade bottle? And if that was, let's say, a mixed drink, I mean, especially when you're 18, 19 years old, uh, you drink some kind of silly stuff. You know, you, uh, <laughs> I, I, here, I'm going to laugh, Captain, and, I'm, and I don't mean to get you off track. We'll go right back to you here. Drinking some silly stuff, mm-hmm. you know. One drink that I like, this is going to be considered one of those 18, 19 year old drinks. I like to, I get some vodka. You turned me onto the Tito's vodka. Yeah, Tito's is good. Very good vodka. I get some of that and I do about a half and half job with that very light, the diet Gatorade. You know, I like the purple, the purple kind. Mm -hmm. I drink some of that. It's very funny looking. People usually make fun of me when they see me having a little glass of that. But I like drinking it because I get I get that vodka feeling that I love without the hangover in the morning because I'm hydrating with the Gatorade at the same time. But what you're saying here he is he likes to call that drink purple drink. <laughs> he could have come up with he could have made some kind of concoction and put it in this Gatorade bottle right. and carried it around with him for the remainder of the evening. Like you said, he's in these parties, but this quote unquote emergency meeting was actually a scheduled emergency meeting. Um, so he knew he was going to be attending this. Did he, did he create some kind of drink for himself, some purple drink like the Nick likes mm-hmm. and, and bring it to the emergency meeting with him to, to sip on, uh, as the night grew longer and longer. Yeah. And I would, I would also claim that I probably puked more from uh 16 to 20 than I have 20 to 30. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, well, well maybe, maybe not 20 to 30, but Definitely from uh, 30 to where I'm at now. But so that would be my question. Was he continuing drinking? And if he was, you know, why would he leave? Now, I've heard some speculation. You know, some people uh, smoke when they drink. I I don't think there was any evidence of him being a smoker. So I'm just going to kind of rule that out. So then why would you want to go outside? Mm -hmm. Uh, That that's the big question here. Why is he leaving this area? Now, was it to go back to his room or was he looking for a bathroom or mm-hmm. I mean, because look, that's a big thing with guys more so than with females is, I mean, we, we pee anywhere, you know? <laughs> so sometimes, you know, you're at a party and you're going, man, there's people in the bathroom and then you just take off and go around the side of the house, right? <laughs> write your name. Uh, I normally like to write Nick's name because then if I'm, if they, if they see the P, you know, it's pl- plus it's a lot easier to write than, than the captain. Mm-hmm. But uh, was he going out to pee, you know, to take a pee? Or was he going to get sick? And sometimes when you go to get sick, you're looking for a bathroom. But if you can't find one, if you can get outside, that's better than puking in the hotel lobby. Mm-hmm. And you touched upon something that we have talked about before on the show because we covered some other disappearances. Drinking. We've Yeah. We've covered the Joey Labute disappearance. Uh, he was ultimately found in the river. We co- we covered Brian Schaefer. Um, and that always brings up the thought of this, uh, what is it, the happy face or smiley face killer that's going all over the country and, and killing these young college men. Mm-hmm. And uh, their bodies are ultimately found in the river eventually. And and we mentioned on those shows when we've brought, when we've brought that up that we find it more likely that the person that had fallen into the river was, was probably an intoxicated young male that had hit his limit way earlier in the night and decided to urinate alongside the river or in the river Mm -hmm. and inadvertently fell in and met their demise that way. Well, but yeah, the the tough thing about the smiley face killer theory is I'm probably one of the only uh, true crime dorks out there that is, you know, kind of likes this theory. Uh, not in this case, mm-hmm. but the the theory overall, and what I've I've stated, and the funny thing was I brought up at, at CrimeCon when I was talking to Devin from uh, Thinking Sideways, you know, I I brought it up and she said smiley face killer, and she started laughing mm-hmm. uh, because a lot of people find this theory to be laughable. Now I f- I feel like they they made a mistake in their theory. These and for people that don't know the theory, it's this simple. These retired these retired detectives were uh, studying some cases. They found that there was some graffiti b- 
by the bridges or alongside the riversides that these bodies were found. And it was a smiley face. Now, a smiley face is probably the most common graffiti in all of mankind, right? Mm -hmm. Along with some words that you say. Right. (laughs) You say those words too. I know. But but you're a prune on the show. So, (laughs) but the thing is, is, uh, so if you, if you ixnay the graffiti, right, Mm -hmm. from the smiley face killer, I don't think it's it's that far fetched to to think that there is a killer or a possible a ring of killers that mm-hmm. are that are rounding up these individuals and not necessarily to just be found in in a body of water. There's a lot, um, you know. Jesse Ross is one of them, a college age student that went missing and has never been seen again, mm-hmm. and has been seen you know last seen drinking. Or partying with people now. Now Jesse wasn't last seen drinking with people. He was at an emergency meeting. But if there was an emergency meeting, Jesse would have been last seen drinking with people. Right. And the thing is, this is the Chicago police's theory, and that what they state is that you know it's you know people don't fall into this river every day. But they're stating that it does. It's more common than one would think. Yes. And but and if you want to Google it. Uh, the what was interesting to me is a lot of times when one person fall, falls in, that multiple people that they're with fall in. Because mm, they're trying to save them or... Yeah, I mean, there was this case where I, I believe one individual died, but three people fell into the river and they're trying to retrieve a cell phone. Mm-hmm. So one of the beliefs that the police... You know, the thing is, is why he's going down to that river. One, maybe, maybe drank too much, he's going to get sick. Maybe he needs to empty out his bladder. Right. Mm -hmm. Maybe he wanted to take a picture. Right. Well, who knows? So maybe his cell phone drops in or maybe he's peeing and and falls in. Um, Maybe he just goes out to catch a breath of fresh air, decides to stand by the scenic side of of this hotel and take a look at the river. Something catches his eye mm -hmm. and draws him near. He starts walking close to the river. The thing here is it's extremely it would be cold out that night. And I think you had some of those numbers for us. Uh, but, but there's a potential of ice of an Mm -hmm. ice situation. Maybe he didn't simply fall. Maybe he slipped and fell into the river. Um, possible. Yeah. So the, the police, this is their theory. It seems, I hate to say this captain. It seems likely to me. Um, it's also, yeah, it's, it's the A to B theory. Mm Mm-hmm. Just because this is the nearest point that would present a danger to this person that has gone missing. Mm -hmm. You know, we see him what has been reported as moving in the direction of the exits, referring to what was seen on the surveillance. And just like the captain said, I was unable to find the actual footage of him walking in the direction of the exits, but there is a, there is a still photo Mm -hmm. of him in that area. Now, I'll try to find that and put that on Instagram. They did state in those reports, though, that they never actually see him exit the building, but they they anticipate that that's what he was intending to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, this is the nearest point that creates a danger for Jesse and maybe a good a good explanation for what happened to him. You had mentioned that the but, Chicago River empties into Lake Michigan. Right, but the, the, the problem with this theory, though, too, is it's also the lazy theory. And I really question, you know, we're talking about an area that's, you know, um, you know, as far as tourists go, we really need to have a good reputation or Chicago needs a really good reputation of this area being safe. And so what do they do? They have a bunch of surveillance and to, to claim that you don't find him on any other tape Mm -hmm. is just so unlikely to me. Even, you know, if he heads back, if he heads back to his hotel room that we're talking about a path that is heavily lit, heavily traveled, and also heavily surveillance. And if he goes to the left, there's still some surveillance. Why isn't he caught on any of these other tapes? Right. And you would think that if he fell into the river, that he was either, A, chose to go that route for some reason, uh, what his destination would be, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Or B, what I think would be more likely, is that if he were over by the river, that he was just simply milling about just kind of hanging out, waiting out this break, catching some fresh air, maybe having a smoke. I, I like you said, no evidence There's to no point evidence to that. Of that. Um, but maybe out there just milling about, having some fresh air, and waiting to go back in after the thirty-minute break. My thought is, if he if he did 
um, fall in is to me, it'd be more likely that he would be, you know, vomiting. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because this whole theory that, you know, guys go and they pee off a bridge and then they just fall in. I look, I've peed pretty drunk before, right? Where, you know, uh, you're just kind of (laughs) swaying, but to, to fall in, uh, to a river that would be, you know, I don't know, less likely, but if you're heaving, uh, I could totally see that being more likely of a scenario. Oh yeah, because your whole body is convulsing, your whole body is out of control. Mm-hmm. And so, s- sometimes your sight is blurred. Your you know your vision mm-hmm. is definitely impaired when you're in that situation. Now, you and I talked about um, uh, talked about the the situation of he didn't appear to be intoxicated. Nobody in that that group of 30 people in that meeting thought that he was intoxicated. His mm-hmm. friend that Ralph Parker didn't believe that, that he was, that Jesse was drunk. Um, but we're talking about, first of all, we're talking about two thirty AM, right? Who knows how long he was drinking? Who knows what how, was how, in that, can, that Gatorade bottle? Well, first of all, how many of those people were drinking? Mm-hmm. Because, you know, I was just at this uh, alumni event for my town. Um, and I had like maybe two beers. Mm -hmm. So everybody else around me is super wasted. Right. Right. I can tell this because I only had two, two beers. Um, how many of these people, you know, because I'm sure some of the people, if I said, Oh, so-and-so was wasted, they'd say, Oh, they weren't that bad, but that's all, you know, normally depending on how bad off you are. So I, I wonder how many of these people in this emergency meeting were drinking themselves. And yes, so yeah, maybe not intoxicated during the meeting, but he he was also, for all we know, as far as eyewitnesses go, he was sitting down during this meeting. Well, yeah. uh, and you had a, uh, you were telling me an interesting story on the phone the other day about a bar we used to play. Yeah, so there's this story has a bit of a double whammy <laughs> effect on it. Okay, and, Whammy. and might have some insight to the state of Jesse Ross. I had this situation many, many years ago. I probably was uh, a year or two older than Jesse. But as you had mentioned earlier, your your tolerance is a lot lower at that age for most people, I would believe, uh, as far as how much alcohol you consume and how much you can handle over the course of an evening or an entire night. And we, w- I was at this bar that we had played at, our band had played at several times, but I don't believe we were playing that night. I think I went there to see some a friend's band. And I belly up to the bar as soon as I get there. This is like January. It's very cold out that night. And it's late at night. It's already, have, you know, it's probably 10 o'clock at night by the time I got to the bar. When I decided to leave there, it's around midnight. I sat there, I drank draft beer all night, no shots, mm-hmm. nothing crazy you know, had a, had a decent time, but I get up to leave. I felt fine. I felt like a million bucks. As a matter of fact, I walked out, (laughs) I walked out onto that felt like a million bucks, but I looked like a 10. (laughs) I walked out onto that downtown street, captain, that cold air hit me. And I don't know if it was the combination of, of walking. You know, sometimes when you, when you are sitting and you're drinking, you don't realize how drunk you are until you get up to go. Mm -hmm. And I got up to go and I walked outside and the combination of that and the cold air hitting me, I went from sober as a judge to, to drunk as hell. Mm -hmm. You had scarecrow legs. That's that's right. It it, it was like a ton of bricks had hit me Mm -hmm. and I had to boot, man. I had to run to the, to the nearest trash can and I, I booted and then I went back inside you raft. and I sat at the bar and I drank a whole bunch of water because I was in no shape to drive home. It made me, that experience made me curious about Jesse. You know, why would he go outside if he's not a smoker he, and he's not going out with any other people? You know, he obviously he went out by himself. Uh, what, what is his purpose of going outside? It's either to just hang out, wait out the break, or he has a destination. He, I think what more so points to is that he was probably attempting to leave the meeting and leave that hotel because he didn't go outside with anybody with him. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if I were just taking a break, I would mention to somebody in the group, hey, what are you going to do for the 30 minute break? Oh, you're going to go sit over there. Oh, is there still a hotel party going on? Or, or you want to come outside and hang out with me for a few minutes? Mm-hmm. Um, I think him going by himself points to a situation where he may had a destination in mind 
And for whatever reason, if he did not appear to be intoxicated, he could have been very intoxicated like my situation. Right. So he got outside Right, and the eyewitnesses at the emergency meeting claimed that he was no sign of him being intoxicated. Then Chicago PD comes out and they say, well, there's no sign of him being intoxicated as far as the surveillance either. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about a very small room that they would have footage of him in and for him to walk a straight line or, or to not look intoxicated. I mean, look also if he was a man on the, on a mission again, you know, when you're getting to the point where you might get sick, sometimes you start getting the sweats, right? You know, and so you're going, I'm going to get outside, get some cool air, you know, and then if I do get sick, I'm at least outside. I'm not puking in the hotel tell lobby, like I said before. Well, your adrenaline can take over and can carry you a certain amount of distance. Um, the thing here is that the river was, as we said, it was it empties into Lake Michigan which can be hundreds of miles long. You know, it's a great lake. It's mm-hmm. huge. It's not like some lake that you go visit somewhere. It's it's a huge body of water. <laughs> it, it is a lake that you go visit somewhere. <laughs> it's, now, it's not a man-made lake is probably what you're trying to get at. Divers, they didn't find. Divers and search groups did search the river itself on several occasions. And despite several searches, they did not find uh, any of Jesse's remains or evidence that would lead you to think that he had fallen into the river. Right. But there's several bodies that end up, you know, watching ashore or, or coming to the surface once they get to Lake Michigan. Mm-hmm. And over the years, these bodies have appeared. And unfortunately, you know, every time this happens, we have Jesse's parents who are there wondering if that's Jesse that has surfaced. Well, and I think initially when the first, part of the investigation came out that his parents didn't want to believe it was something as simple as an accident. Mm -hmm. Right. So then it became, or, or possibly that he was also somewhat responsible for that uh, accident if he was very intoxicated. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um, I don't think they wanted to believe it at first, but now that we're 11 years out, every time a body comes up and the, or is found in, in Lake Michigan, they're somewhat hopeful that they at least will find his remains. So therefore they would get some closure. Yeah. And that sounds crazy to say that they're somewhat hopeful, but you're exactly right. Captain, they've already reserved themselves to the thought that so much time has passed that he, he must have passed on himself. Yeah. And this idea too, a lot of people talk about that. Oh, well he probably went downtown, right? Uh, there was a speculation that he wanted to pass out these records to different record companies um, and that he would do this at 2.30 in the morning. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make a lot of logical sense to me. Yeah, yeah, there's two stories, and these were presented by people in the group, within the group that he traveled with. Uh, One being that he wanted to get these CDs to different radio stations. Of course, the radio stations can be, you know, most of them are open, 24 Mm seven, you know, they're operating 24 seven. Um, I don't know that anybody's going to answer the door. If you come knocking at two 33 in the morning, it seems like an odd time to be dropping them off. Um, you would think he, he may have some connections that he may have. He knows the business a little bit. He may know the appropriate time and people to drop these things off to without doing it at three in the morning. Um, the other thing, uh, the thought was that the band, remember we mentioned the band, he was still at this time in his life, he was still promoting a band. Now, I don't Mm -hmm. know if it's the same band that we mentioned the dead giveaway. Um, but he, he had brought flyers with him that he wanted to pass out at a bar if there was an opportunity. Now, this was just something that he mentioned to somebody that he was traveling with. There's nobody has any proof that, that he ever did this at any point on this trip. Right. It seems, again, seems strange to me that he would choose 2.30 or 3 o'clock in the morning to do this. This was his last night there, so maybe he felt this was his last opportunity. Right. I heard that some of the bars in Chicago will stay open till about 4 a.m., right. um, so this there was an opportunity to, to do this. But again, I think the timing seems unlikely. 30 eyewitnesses that never said that he had anything, a flyer or anything. You'd think if he had a stack of flyer that 30 eyewitnesses would at least one of them would have said, Hey, we saw him with this stack of flyers. And from the still photo that we saw from the surveillance camera, 
the only thing that appears to be in his hands is that Gatorade bottle. Let's get back to this and more theories right after this quick purple drink break. All right, Captain, I'll tell you what, I think the f- the fall in the river scenario, I think we got to put that more towards the higher possibility end of the spectrum. Would you agree? Yeah. I mean, I think it's most logical. Mm-hmm. That leads us right next to right into the next theory uh, that he was attempting to return to the hotel or as you had stated and I had stated was that he was attempting to go to a bar or someplace downtown Mm -hmm. And he was met with foul play along the way. Right. So, I mean, again, where's the evidence? Right. Um, And and the thing here is we have, you know, we have Jesse's mother. Um, You know, his father's name is Donald and her name is Donna. Um, So we have Donna and Dawn uh, Ross. But Donna Mm -hmm. says, you know, the police cannot prove to us that he even left that hotel building. Right. You know, so... And then, like you said, with the, with the river thing possibly being a lazy theory um, by the police, my my argument, if I'm the parents, and maybe they've done this, would be, okay, if you can't prove to me that that he even left the hotel room, prove to me that he, or the hotel building, prove to me that he did not leave the hotel building. Because <laughs> no, what well, I'm, what are you saying? What I'm saying is when they say to, when they say to us, I, we don't know what happened to your son mm-hmm. because we can't prove that he even left that hotel building. I'm saying back, well, prove to me that he did not leave that hotel building. Meaning there's surveillance cameras. Yeah. Start there along, right, right. along his route back to his hotel. I think it's easy for all of us to agree that that would be, that seems like the most likely destination at two 30 in the morning for a guy that has a 10 minute walk to get back to where his bed is um, and his belongings are where he needs to be in the morning time for when they leave. I think this seems like the most likely scenario that he might have attempted to leave. But if I'm the parents, I want proof that he was not on that route, you know? And if you tell me that you've seen surveillance and he's not on any of those pictures, let me see it with my eyes. Let me look at the, at the time that elapsed from two 30 until about three thirty or four in the morning so that I can say, you know what? That person right there is not my son. That person you see walking is not my son. That person is not my son. Well, that's my big question in this whole case itself is the collection of these different surveillance tapes. And, and was he actually seen in the hotel lobby or somewhere else in that hotel? Again, that's what makes it so confusing. One, like I said, from the beginning, I think it's irresponsible. Yeah, they're 18, 19, maybe even 20 year old students, but to have a emergency meeting so late at night, it doesn't matter if it was 2 a.m. or if it was 1 a.m. That's still too late, especially when the when the two um, buildings are not connected. And when we're at CrimeCon, for example, uh, a lot of the podcasters, let's say uh, Bob Ruff from uh, Truth and Justice and uh, Generation Y, uh, crawl space guys, a, bu- a bunch of people, white wine, true crime. True crime. Uh, we're all just looking for a place to meet up and drink uh, well, thinking sideways. And everybody, all the names that we just mentioned, all those famous, you know, wonderful podcasts out there of names we just dropped. You owe us a round for next year's <laughs> crime cod. Okay. Yeah. You guys owe it. How about two rounds? They owe us two <laughs> rounds. No, but one of the things that we talked about when I was like, oh, well, let's meet up for a drink and let's have a meet up with uh, listeners and, and, and friends. And at first, the, the kind of conversation was, okay, well, what's good in Indianapolis? Mm-hmm. Well, my question then was, well, how are these individuals are going to get there? And if it's in walking distance, then are we putting people at risk by getting drunk and then having to walk, you know, even if it's 10 minutes away? I love the captain um, thinking like a man that's talked about too many horrible crimes and accidents that have happened to people. Yeah. Well, I think some of these people were just looking for, uh, you know, more, um, content for their show. I, <laughs> I, I wasn't really, I, I actually really didn't give a shit about anybody's, um, safety It was more my safety. <laughs> like if I'm going to drink, uh, I want to get hammered. I want to get it to the point where, you know, 
Uh, I become this small, you know, a little Alice in Wonderland, and I'm and I all I have to do is crawl my way back up to my room. Mm -hmm. So, again, I like I said with this case, I think it's irresponsible um, that that they had this uh, emergency meeting so late, ten minutes walking away, mm -hmm. and and you know it's dark in a city that people these students are not familiar with, and that you know that there's a dance. But you probably knew that there was drinking going on as well. Well, and you know that on the flip side, people are going to argue with you and they're going to say, you know what, Captain? Well, these are adults and they are they're kids. You know, we're having this emergency meeting. So we want to give them the feel and the taste of a real emergency meeting. So we're going to hold it at an inconvenient time. I'm with you. I'm with you. I think it's irresponsible on behalf of the people in charge of organizing the event to hold something so late at night. We're going to have a fictitious emergency meeting for a fictitious UN. You know. Right. You could hold an emergency meeting at any time. Right, right. But the thing is they hold all these fictitious, uh, you know, horse shit when, when the, but the, uh, but the threat is still real, right? Mm -hmm. You know, the danger is still real. So I just think it's irresponsible. Yeah. I mean, if you want to hold it at an inconvenient time, you can interrupt their breakfast. You can interrupt their lunch yeah. or another scheduled event. Um, so I get it that you're trying to create an atmosphere amongst that group. I just think it's irresponsible. Like you said, it's 2.30 in the morning. Some of these people are staying at a hotel that's a 10-minute walk. And we all know. You know, you don't have to be an, an Einstein or a Sherlock Holmes to understand that the Chicago crime rate and murder rate are significantly higher than many other cities and the rest of this country. Well, again, like I said, okay, so I have an issue with was there enough um, work put in to get the surveillance tapes? Um, because I think, look, I think, again, like we said, this is a couple days before Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I think some of these cops thought, you know what, this guy's a... He, kid seems like a smart kid seems like a good kid he's going to turn up i don't think initially they're just like well he fell into the river and that's what happened mm -hmm. <laughs> no but it's like they i don't think they did their work and then with the eyewitness accounts you can't tell me if the meeting started at 1 a.m or 2 a.m right it's like there's so many contradictory stories there and, and then it then it becomes well how much surveillance footage do you need do you need the time where he walked in and then the time that he walked out and maybe there's another time or how, how did you put here? Here's my other question for the uh, Chicago PD. Do they have the video footage of him walking from his hotel to this emergency meeting? Mm -hmm. Cause I'd like to see that. And then from that point to the, until 3 AM, 4 AM, I want to see all that footage. And I don't think they pulled that. And I think they got lazy. And like I said, I think, you know, I think they just assumed that this kid is going to come up. It's, you know, it's this big trip, 1200 students. He's just going to, show up. Mm -hmm. And I think this was the frustration that the Ross family had from the get go, you know, and then once they didn't collect this evidence and once they didn't talk to all the people that they should have talked to. Yeah. I think it haunts this guy, but I think it haunts him because they, they know they didn't try hard enough. Mm -hmm. And so then we would go, okay, well, what was the logical thing? Well, the logical thing is he fell into the river. Yeah. Yeah. And you're right. That wasn't their initial thought. That was not like they, they showed up to the hotel, they took a quick look around, and they were like, oh, guy fell into the river. Seen it 100,000 times. No, it was, like you said, it was after a couple of days that they kind of come to that conclusion. Um, I, I think they were looking for leads, obviously. I think they were trying to track down some leads, but I'm with you. It's like my understanding was that, they, that he would have been in this specific hotel building for a decent amount of time. You know, that this there was this scheduled dance there was some events there. There were people hosting hotel room parties. And then there's this emergency meeting. He would have been there for a considerable amount of time before he left or fell into the river at 2.30 in the morning. Um, so regarding the surveillance footage of him arriving to the hotel could be difficult depending on the group, the, the amount of people walking in and out. But, I, but I'm with you. I, I, where is all this footage? I Again, I go back to the parents. Say, right, so you're going to tell me that these 30 students walked hand in hand together. Uh, and so it makes it hard to have the footage going in. But then this one lone wolf just walked out by himself. 
Again, this also kind of, you know, hints to me a little bit like Elisa Lamb, right? Mm -hmm. We have all this video footage, but then all of a sudden we have nothing. Like, you know, the big thing about her and the and the, um, the elevator is that we don't have the lobby footage. And if we had the lobby footage, that would change some things. But remember, there was some, you know, technical difficulties with them. And so that's why we don't have them. So was there technical difficulties with these these trail cams or other surveillance footage from that area? Mm hmm. You know, well, and the thought here too is regarding the hotel that Jesse's staying at. Um, Ralph Parker went back there at some point. He went back there after he thought Jesse had returned to that hotel. Now, can you show me law enforcement? Can you show me that you were able to decipher who Ralph Parker was according to the surveillance footage at that hotel mm -hmm. when he walked into the building? Because we've seen these security cameras. We've seen some of the footage that they that they record. Sometimes you can't decipher. You can tell it's a person. You can. You might right, be right. able to. You might be able to. It's, it's a person, right? You might be able to judge if they're three foot tall or six foot tall. You might be able to judge if they're light skinned or dark skinned, but you might not be able to know anything other than the guy had on a a purple ball cap or he had on a uh, green ball cap. You right. know, you might not be able to to tell me that that's not Jesse Ross walking there. You might not be able to tell me that it's Ralph Parker walking into the hotel unless you have written down from his account of that evening exactly what time that he walked into that hotel. Yeah, I'd like to know where his whereabouts were. I mean, I don't, I don't find his story to be that fishy, though. No. I mean, it's, it's very logical to think that somebody opens up their hotel room, uh, it's dark, you see a pile on the bed, you know, you, you just assume that it's Jesse, and then you fall asleep. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are not going to turn on that light. He might have been intoxicated himself, and just, again, like, uh, like I said earlier, uh, just pulling this, you know, I got to crawl to my bed. You know, that's all, maybe that's all he was worried about. This you know, it, that's the thing when you're drinking, you get, you become a survivalist. I just need to get to my bed at some point. Um, especially when, uh, I'm drinking some liquor, but, um, so I think his story is logical. Then he wakes up in the morning and Jesse's not there. Well, is it that far fetched to think, oh, this guy got up and got going. Maybe he had something to do. Maybe he was hungry, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I don't find his story illogical, but at the same point, show me him on the surveillance footage. Right. Show him walking and, back to his hotel. Show him walking into the lobby of his hotel. Well, right. And, and I've seen Parks and Rec, so I'm no dummy, right? Mm -hmm. I've seen Parks and Rec, and, and what do you, what do, you, what do we know? That's the line of dummy. People that people that have not seen Parks and Rec, you're you're a dummy. People that literally, have, you are <laughs> literally no. But I've seen it, and the and the funny thing is, you know, I you know I don't want to make a big joke about this, but the idea that there are these heated debates and these, even though it's a fictitious, you know, it's this mock UN thing, um, there are some heated debates, and some people take this stuff very seriously. So again, that would. Um, some crazy loon student. Uh, I think uh, Jesse was in charge of uh, Zaire. Hmm. So did was Zaire stepping on somebody's toes and was some nefarious act taking place because of a debate? Um, so we have video footage of him, Jesse, possibly leaving. I want the video footage of all the other students. Right. Where's their whereabouts? Because those 30 students in that in that room... They're suspects, high suspects, you know, because they would have more contact with them than the other 1,200. Mm -hmm. And they would have been, you know, um, we can assume some of the last people to see Jesse live. Right. And, and why aren't these people questioned more? And did all of them return to the meeting after the break or remain seated during the break? Right. Or who went back to the hotel? Mm -hmm. Who left? Who went for a smoke break? You know, who went to get some more booze? And that's what I keep going back to, Captain. That if if he did, in fact, leave the hotel building, to me, it points more that he had a destination in mind because he left by himself. Um, right. And, but to me, that... To me, look, if you're at a party, you normally don't make an announcement or want somebody to come hold your hand while you go yak. Right. right. 
So to me, that would be the motivation there. Now, the thing here is you've walked us well into the other theories. Um, and I think that you can kind of lump these together in a way. So I'll kind of just mention them both and we'll talk about them uh, as they pertain to his story and maybe possibly one another. But so the other thought is, um, and this was presented, you know, by other people, but I heard his mother state this in an interview. Donna said, you know, how do we know that the, he didn't go back to a hotel room within that hotel building, that he never left that hotel building during the break, that mm -hmm. he went to a hotel room either to continue to party, to talk to somebody that he had spoken to earlier that night, mm -hmm. or simply just to go somewhere to hang out for the 30 minute break. You know, she says, you can't prove to me that he left that building. And she says, how do we know there wasn't some kind of accident in one of these hotel rooms and somebody decided to cover it up? This would be pointing toward uh, that situation, but also pointing towards somebody in the group, in that group of 1,200 students. Well, I've always thought the idea of a student or a person ODing and then people dumping the body somewhere or covering up was complete just uh, malarkey. Mm-hmm. Uh, until I've been reading about it nonstop. Like it's been happening a lot. Uh, I think there was three or four girls charged uh, from Ohio state because they, they, they literally dumped the body uh, at the hospital. They just, the girl OD'd. Wait, so they, they, they pull up in a car and just, just roll the body out of the car and dump, dump it, it at the footstep of the, of the mm -hmm. uh, hospital. Dead. Dead. Yeah. And they're going to be charged. And there's multiple cases. If you're going to do that, why not just call the ambulance? I don't, because for whatever reason, again, you know, they're not adults, you know, right. it's not the forties, fifties, sixties, maybe even seventies anymore. I would you argue know, that those people might not have been adults back then as well, but yeah, but you're right. Different time though. And I, I think people expected people to be more mature at a younger age. And I think people ex expected people to grow up a lot faster hmm. uh, than we do today. Um, and I think we kind of coddle people and put people into these little safe spaces. So it, it's not out of the realm of possibility that he was partying with some people and, and, and something bad happened again. Like the mother says, prove to me that he left, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I think that's a real possibility, but again, it's questioning those 30 some people. So, uh, I'm interested to see because supposedly there's a documentary coming out about this. Uh, the The little trailer I saw of it was absolutely horrible uh, as far as a, a film standpoint, but I'm interested on what they were able to uncover because the other problem too about this is there's a lot of podcasts that then go in and investigate just one case, spend their whole time on that. You know, I think we met uh, Payne from uh, Up and Vanished. And very cool thing. This is a case that would be almost impossible to do because you got 1,200 students at this event. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can start with the 30, but this this would be a, a monster undertaking. Yeah. There, yeah, there is a documentary coming out at some point, um, and it's uh, done by a guy that's from his hometown or from his area, from Jesse Ross's area. Uh, I don't know the date of when that's to be released other than the article I read was stating that it was due to be out later this year. Um, Captain says it looks terrible. I've not seen uh, just the trailer looks terrible, but I, what I'm hoping is that this individual was able to um, uncover some things that, that we can't find. Mm -hmm. I've not seen the trailer myself. Um, Captain, th the thing here is though, you know, fall in the river. I put that at a high probability. Um, a hotel accident, a hotel room accident. The only thing that it, there, there's one thing that points me to that. And again, that's, they cannot prove that he actually walked outside the four walls of that hotel. Right. Um, the other problem with that though, is you, you, again, you know, it's like with the suicide thing. Well, where's Jesse? Where's the body? Where's, um, you think that you might see, depending on what type of accident it could have been, you would think there would have been some kind of evidence of such that took place in some kind of hotel room. And obviously he would have had to have been, his body would have had to have been removed from that hotel at some point. Mm -hmm. um, but again, you're up against this situation like the police said, where you get to an area, you get to, you, there's a, f a report filed. We go out to investigate. There's no crime scene. There's no crime scene for us to go. Something happened here. <laughs> And furthermore, you, you're hearing about something 
who knows? He could have actually disappeared at 2.30 in the morning. There could, yeah. there could have been nobody that seen him after 2.30 in the morning until it's reported at approximately 4 p.m. the next day. And many people have left this hotel. Rooms have been cleaned. People, you know, people have been in and out of these rooms. Yeah, and I, and I know I, I sound like I'm throwing the police on, under the bus and saying that they didn't do their due diligence. One, first of all, they're understaffed, they're undermanned, they're, they're underfunded, uh, under resources. This is also weirdly happening. It's, it's an adult, so I think it becomes less of an urgent situation. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, it's, it's a bunch of people at this. You know, He seems like a good kid. He's probably going to show up. And then you got Thanksgiving a couple days beforehand. I think that factors into things a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I don't want to make it seem like I'm completely faulting them. Like if they would have done everything they're supposed to do, we would have we'd have a closure for his family. Uh, I, I I don't believe that. I think you know, I think they ran into some brick walls here. Yeah, there are certainly yeah. incidences when when we have seen plenty of times before where there just appears to be no answers. There there doesn't there's no arrows pointing the police and investigators in any type of direction to come to any conclusions at all. Um, now, one thing the the parents have, as you said, you know, they don't they they seem to be unhappy with the police. They unhappy with the investigative efforts as mm-hmm. far as when it comes to Jesse. Now he, you, it's understandable. I mean, they're not getting the results that they want, so you're going to be you're going to be upset. You're going to be unhappy. That doesn't mean that they didn't do everything they could do. Now, one right. thing that uh, Don Ross has brought up, there was a strange incident uh, regarding the Chicago Police Department where his... So Jesse Ross is on the national database for missing persons. This is on the uh, NCIC. Um, and for whatever reason, I don't know if it was a glitch in the system, but he, his name was removed. And his father was discovered this. I don't know if somebody told him about it or whatever, but he called the Chicago police department and he told the investigators involved. He said, look, my son's name is no longer on this database for missing persons. Did you find him? Of course, is the first thing he wants to know. And then second of all, he wants to know, well, why would his name be removed? I don't know the specifics of why it was taken off. But the problem that Don Ross has with the investigation and that I would have with this investigation as well is that he alerted them of this and they seem to drag their feet about putting him back onto that database. So the way the database works is that information has to be uploaded, uploaded and inputted by somebody, by one of the investigators involved in the case. So mm-hmm. that that database didn't do anything wrong. They sit around waiting for somebody to give them the information. Unless it was a glitch. Right. Um, regardless, though, Captain. Yeah, but here's how it works. You file a missing person report, right? Then you go looking for the person. If the police find the person, they have no legal responsibility to tell the family that we found this person <clears throat> and that he is okay. They have no legal responsibility to do so. Right. And... And that's that's on them. Now they might, let's say Jesse went missing on his own uh, cord, and they go, Jesse, we, do you want us to tell your family? No, they don't have any responsibility to tell the family. Oh, we found him. He's okay. They have a re- responsibility to the city and the taxpayers to close the case. Mm-hmm. So I wonder if, on some level, it was one of these things where they closed the case, and then. They said uh, somebody found out about it and then they end up putting him back on the thing so they don't have to have the odd conversation with the family that, oh, we found him. He just doesn't want anything to do with you. That's certainly a possibility. Which would lead to the odd speculation of, you know, if there was something, you know, look, look, for all we know, his family was super religious and he had some different way of life he wanted to live and that was not kosher to them. Mm Mm-hmm. So I, I don't know. Yeah, we don't know the dynamics of of his family. One thing I will say though that kind of to to keep their son's case alive um, and to keep it in the minds of the Chicago Police Department and their investigators, um, they have asked friends and loved ones and anybody that visits findjessieross.com to on Jesse's birthday send 
a birthday card to the Chicago Police Department. Um, well, I, c- I commend them, and I I feel sorry for them, but also they you know they they haven't really uncovered much else. I mean, that's the problem with this case, and probably at this point, you know, we got to start moving on from this case because there is so many holes. There's so many what ifs, you know, but I mean, we could speculate on it for 10 hours if we wanted Mm. to. Well, and the other thing though, I do want to throw this in because some people find it extremely defiant that the Ross family would, would send birthday cards to the Chicago police department. I, I think they're just trying to keep their son's case alive and well, um, and, and, keep hope that they will get some answers at some point. So I I don't think that it's defiant. And I also do want to include that according to Donald Ross's bio, um, I don't know how long he, this was a career choice for him, but according to his bio, he did work as a police officer uh, at one time. He did hold many jobs over the course of his, his years. So um, it could have just been a short lived career, but so he does have some ties and some knowledge of police work. Yeah, I, I I think with all these cases, when there's a missing uh, child, uh, we all tend to judge their their families and their parents on what they're doing. But at the end of the day, none of us know how we would react to this situation. If you want to dive more into this case, check out that website that we've mentioned. The other thing, too, is one thing that was glaring to me as I watched interviews with his parents I do believe the parents when they state that, you know, he was close to us, that he was close to, he he called us, he checked in with us. We always had a close relationship. And the other thing that I saw too, you know, it's, it's, it's quite common that you see a son, you know, his hero may be his father. That that's a common thing to see. Now I see this situation, the way that Don Ross speaks about Jesse Ross, his son, it almost comes off to me that, his son was his hero. You know, he talks about Jesse being very outgoing, being fearless, being somebody that liked to play jokes on people that he loved and cared about. And it it seemed that he admired his son for these traits. So, uh, truly a heartbreaking story. We're not going to give up on you, Jesse. Uh, we think that there's some hope out there and hopefully one day the parents and his brother will get the answers that they need and deserve. I have a handful of cases that I have on a list and I'll just random do a random Google search. And this is one that I'll uh, head back to. And hopefully there's more information that comes out soon. This week's recommended reading is where's Opie vanished in Chicago by Donald Ross, Jesse's father. Where's Opie allows the reader to ride along with the family of Jesse Opie Ross and learn details of his disappearance in Chicago. Learn what it's like day to day living with the reality of a missing son and brother and finding the courage to go on. Learn how such an event affects a family, friends, and law enforcement. Remember, this could happen to any of us. Donald Ross has two books on the subject. The first to come out was published in 2011. So please check out Where's Opie. And you can do that by going to our website, truecrimegarage.com. Check out the recommended page and use our Amazon banner for all of your purchases. All right. Thank you, Colonel. Thank you, Captain. And we'll see everybody back here next week. Same garage time, same garage channel. Until then, be good, be kind, and don't listen.